All right, Ed All right. Kelly. Ed and I know each other for oh. 20 years. Uh, yes. It really must be. Yeah, just and about. I love this man, and uh, he could talk to me for four days without stopping, and I wouldn't be bored. <laughs> but I want you to tell him, we're, we're sitting now in a room in DOPS, the Department of Perceptual Studies at the University of Virginia. Correct. Am I right? Yes, indeed. So what's it all about? DOPS is probably the oldest and most productive university-based organization in the world devoted exclusively to the study of things that challenge current mainstream orthodoxy about mind, brain, the possibility of survival, and all of that. I love it. As you know, I mm -hmm. love it. Yeah. Because I got into Cambridge on science, and thank God I escaped. <laughs> I escaped by going to the law, and I escaped from that too. But what I did, uh, what I did have from early on was a certain skepticism about how much of science was, you know, kosher. Mm -hmm. uh, and it always seemed to me that there were a lot of people around who were pretending that science was not what it was. So I'm fascinated. Mm -hmm. You're looking at the sort of stuff that scientists either disapprove of or laugh at. It was a bit of crude way of putting it. Yeah, yeah? Well, very much. Give me an example. Well, uh, anything that pertains to survival, mm -hmm or to paranormal stuff attracts lots of hostility from mainstream scientists. And particularly, I should say, psychologists, neuroscientists, biologists, because those guys tend to live in the world of late 19th century physics. Pre-Einstein. Yes, and pre-quantum theory. You know, everybody knows, all scientists know that those things exist. But most of them see them sort of way off in the distance somewhere. You know, the relativity deals with huge scale things. Quantum theory deals with little tiny things. But here on our scale, the old ideas strictly hold. Right, so, like we can ignore Einstein. Yeah, we can ignore absolutely. quantum physics. Yeah. And we can pretend that uh, Newton was 100% right. There's nothing else. For our purposes. Yeah, yeah. For and our there purposes. are even arguments in the journal Science exactly to that effect. We can ignore quantum theory. It has nothing to do with the brain. <laughs> Harold Ottensbacher yeah. was taught by one of the co-authors of that article. Really? Yeah. And he's outraged by it. So this anyway. is the, the insanity of it is this, that the most important single factor in being a human being is our consciousness. Mm -hmm. And these guys claim that it's an accidental byproduct of mm -hmm. chemical reactions. Absolutely. Brain, right? Yeah. Well, how can you, I mean, it seems to me so patently absurd. How can you put that into words? It's really hard to understand. And I've, I've said this many times that I think in the not very distant future, a lot of historians and sociologists of science are going to make a good living trying to figure out why it's taken science so long to catch on to the fact that this stuff is everywhere. Well, don't forget doctors sight. bled people for 2,000 oh, yeah. years before okay. they discovered it didn't really work. There you go. So you can't expect anything too fast to happen in the mm -hmm. world of science because yeah. as Max Planck said, um, uh, uh, he said science progresses one funeral at a time. Mm -hmm. It's very hard to yeah. change the mind of a scientist. Right? You bet. I mean, there are many examples in the history of science where scientists are preventing progress of other scientists on things that we now take for granted. Yeah. Can you, you know, give an example? Circulation of the two? blood, for example. Go on, tell me or about that. Or infection, Semmelweis, some right, Circulation of the, of the blood. Yeah. Tell me about that. Well, that's not one I know a great deal about. All right, tell me about, uh, the, tell me about inf infection in yeah. hospitals. Semmelweis caught on to the fact that doctors were spreading infections from one you know, pregnant <laughs> woman having experiencing childbirth being infected and then her infection going to the next one having a child and they were dying right and left. And he tried to convince his colleagues that they could stop that from happening and he basically got run out of the uh, hospital. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's a crude caricature. No, of the but detail. it's beautiful. It's yeah. like, I remember Graham Chapman, Monty Python was a doctor telling me about iatrogenic there diseases, go. diseases caused by doctors. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> in fact, you know, going to a hospital is one of the leading causes of death in the year. Hospital-born infections. Third, the third greatest 
uh, cause of death is medical errors, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I like that. So we have this kind of uh, attitude towards scientists, not just doctors, but mm -hmm. scientists in general. And the fact is that if they come across something they can't explain, mm -hmm. they pretend it really doesn't exist, right? Mm -hmm. You bet. I mean, the kind of stuff that we study challenges deeply held beliefs of many main, mainstream scientists. And some can tolerate that, and some really can't. I mean, mm. it's like a religious thing, you know, it's like... It's exactly like a religious yeah, thing. Secular it's religion. like, like a heresy in the, in the Middle Ages. Yeah, heresy in the temple of science. And uh, they take the attitude a bit like uh, um, <clears throat> Galileo sitting, standing there with his telescope, mm -hmm. right, and the scholastics there, and he's saying, would you please look through my yeah. telescope, and you'll see the craters on the moon, and they're mm -hmm. saying, we don't need to look through mm -hmm. the telescope because yeah. we know they're not there. Yeah. I mean, that's pure insanity, but it, you know, it's a caricature form of what you're up against all mm -hmm. the time. Yeah. And there, is the, you know, there are people out there who made careers out of being professional skeptics, and they're yeah. often very poorly informed. But they don't bother the to truth. read the literature, do Absolutely. they? Absolutely. They yeah. sort of say, uh, we don't need to read the yeah. literature because we know it's rubbish. Yeah. Yeah. So when you're doing stuff here, you uh, impose, you're a bit famous here, for imposing very rigorous scientific procedures. We do our best. You do our best. Talk yeah. a little bit about that. Well, um, I mean, I would really probably turn to my own stuff in the lab at yeah, this point. Sure. I mean, my background is in experimental psychology and neuroscience. And what we want to do is to study things that are going on in the brain and body when people are succeeding at controlled side tasks of various kinds, guessing ESP cards or playing cards or things of that sort. Remote viewing? Yeah, yeah. And that's one of the other examples of this kind of thing. Um, and we're also interested, in fact, I think ultimately more interested in studying certain kinds of altered states of consciousness that we know from historical and some experimental studies are conducive to unusual outbreaks of psi phenomena. So for example, things like deep meditative states, deep hypnotic states, uh, out of body states, things of that sort, mediumship. And when you give details of this kind of research, mm -hmm. um, the skeptics, the people who are determined mm -hmm. that there can be nothing in this, as opposed to people who are skeptic in the possible, proper sense of the word, mm -hmm. which is cautious, right, right, careful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what what would they say to to, for example, an out of body experience when people have come out of their body, mm -hmm. observed very frequently the operation that they're having at mm -hmm. the time, yeah. and then left the operating theater and are able to report on things that you can check factually later that happen outside the mm -hmm. operating room, or things that happen in the operating theater that they couldn't possibly right. uh, uh, know about because of the anesthetics mm -hmm. they were. Well, you know, most of the time, uh, critics of these kinds of experiences essentially deny that evidence. Mm -hmm. They say this is just anecdote. These aren't experiments. These are just reports, mm -hmm. misobservation, misrecollection, things of that sort. Uh, and they'll offer some alternative explanation if, if they even, even a person who accepts the reality of psi can take the view that maybe the, the person who was being operated on, let's say, acquired that information by some kind of a psi process and just dramatizes like a dream the experience of leaving the body and going somewhere. That didn't really happen. So what we have to do if we want to use out-of-body experiences as evidence for survival we really need to get some kind of evidence that something really does leave the body and go somewhere. And sure. that's a kind of experiment that we'd like to do here. We haven't done How it. How far have you got on that? We, we've thought about it. <laughs> it's, it was a good start. We have a half-written proposal. I mean, the most interesting thing for me in the world is does consciousness get produced by the brain? Now, uh -huh. of course, 99% of the people say, of course, where else yeah. could it come from? Oh, wow. But I'm fascinated by the idea that this, this isn't mm -hmm. the creator of it. This is the transmitter, like a television set. A television mm -hmm. set doesn't create the program. It yeah. picks the program up as being created somewhere else and presents it to you so that you can see it. 
And the possibility is that this thing here is picking up stuff from outside and presenting it to us in a way that we can actually see right. what it is. That's really the central argument of our book, Irreducible Mind, yeah. published in 2007. Yeah. Well, wonderful yeah. book, which nobody knows and about. If there is survival, clearly, yeah. consciousness can exist apart from a brain. Well, and when I hear about OBEs, and yeah. I talked to a woman 20 years ago, bad car accident, on the table, mm. um, rose up, uh, went down the corridor, went into the mm -hmm. waiting room, observed her parents watching, uh, sitting around talking, Gilligan's mm. Island on the television, mm -hmm. the, let me get it right, the sister was there, the brother arrived late. And of course, when she came out of the operation, she started talking about this, mm -hmm. and they all got so upset mm -hmm. and worried yeah. about it that they hushed it up. Yeah. There are actually about a hundred cases of that sort in the literature already. Yeah. A hundred. About a hundred, yeah. Janet, uh, Janice Holden has, uh, in particular, looked up a lot of those. There's another slant on this, too, uh, which is really important, and Bruce is the one really to. Bruce Grace. Yeah, I'm talking Well, about he's it. the NDE expert. Yes. Um, a lot of NDEs, not just a few, a lot occur under conditions that are so extreme physiologically that 99% of all neuroscientists would say you cannot have any experience under those conditions. But you, you don't have to look at this because it didn't happen. <laughs> right? No, this time, I mean, th this is a different kind of argument to challenge the mainstream view. Yeah. There's a really well... Uh, a high degree of consensus among neuroscientists about what your brain has to be capable of in order to to express consciousness wherever it comes from. Yeah. And yet, those conditions are strictly abolished in deep general anesthesia and cardiac arrest. And yet, many experiences occur under exactly those circumstances. Now, the way that the way people defend themselves against that is that. Well, you don't really know when the experience occurred. But, no. you see, if the person reports things that were actually happening during the period of unconsciousness, it's getting much harder to deny the force of that argument, which is why anybody who's you know, a, a, a determined defender of the conventional viewpoint, he's going to try to erase all that evidence. Yeah. So that's what's going on. That's the state of the debate right now. And the state of the debate is there are certain things that conventional pre-Einstein, pre-quantum physics mm -hmm. uh, can't explain certain things. That, yeah. and, and they don't want to look at that. Right. Because if they looked at that, the whole structure would begin to crumble. Yeah. Well, of course, a lot of it would stay in place. Of yes, course, a that's lot of really it. Really important. But a key, a key bit mm -hmm. is completely missing at the yes. moment because science doesn't want to look at it. Yeah, yeah. All right. So there. So there. <laughs> <laughs>